disappointing outlook from AOL Time Warner puts its shareholders on the defensive. The result, a huge sell-off in the stock, losing almost 15% of its value. November may have been the cruelest month for the nation's big three automakers. Sales of cars and trucks hit the skids all around. But experts say the problem isn't the sales figures themselves. This man runs a mutual fund that has been doing remarkably well over the last three years, even as the overall market has been doing poorly. The secret is in the selection of stocks. He'll tell us how he decides what to buy. And these people are using the Internet in some of the most rural places in Malaysia. It's part of a new effort there to wire up even the smallest, most remote village, and it's succeeding. I'm Paul Kangas. And I'm Susie Garrow. This is Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, December 3rd. Nightly Business Report is brought to you by... With every solution, we help business move forward. It's an automated, wired, digitized, push zero for more options world. Who can help business make sense of it all? For professional services, the answer is the people of Deloitte and Touche. Franklin Templeton Investments, providing a perspective for success through Franklin, Templeton, and Mutual Series Funds. Franklin Templeton Investments, gain from our perspective. A.G. Edwards, whose financial consultants provide a full range of retirement and estate planning services. A.G. Edwards, trusted advice, exceptional service. Good evening, everyone. A grim forecast from AOL Time Warner triggered another disappointing day on Wall Street. The Dow lost 119 points, and the Nasdaq was down almost 36. Shares of AOL Time Warner plunged almost 15 percent after the company told analysts at a meeting in New York today that sales at its AOL online business will drop sharply. Erica Miller was at that meeting, where AOL also outlined its new online strategy. AOL chairman Steve Case was upbeat emerging from today's meeting, an event that was billed as AOL Day. I think it was a good day in terms of laying out our, our view of where AOL now is and where AOL Time Warner is going, uh, and hopefully it was a, as a helpful uh, perspective on, on where the business is. But Wall Street analysts were not impressed. And the hype leading up to this, this analyst day was bigger than the hype for the opening of Harry Potter. There was no way that it could live up to investor expectations. That happens with these big analyst days. Investors were disappointed by the company's financial projections for 2003. AOL cautioned that revenues are likely to be flat from the previous year, mainly because Internet advertising is expected to plunge by as much as half. The company now expects earnings before interest, depreciation, and amortization to decline 15 to 25 percent from 2002. And the company predicts it will take at least until 2004 for earnings growth to recover. At the heart of the turnaround plan is a renewed focus on exclusive content, a way to attract new customers and keep existing ones. We believe going forward, especially as media richens, like in a broadband environment, that content will again be central to the experience and that our role is not only to package it up, but to integrate it with communication services and community. Analysts say the plan is too ambitious. I think it's going to work by degrees, okay? I don't think that uh, we're going to see the company uh, uh, achieve a stunning success in even a year or two. It's just going to take time. Investors were also skeptical. The stock fell today. The shares are now down almost 70% since the merger was completed in January 2001. But the company says delivering on its strategy will help restore investor confidence. I don't think there's any question is it that Wall Street and investors are in a show-me mode. Uh, so we're going to have to consistently deliver what we tell them we're going to. AOL Time Warner Management will have six months to deliver on its vision for the AOL online unit before the company's annual meeting. If it fails to do so, some analysts predict shareholders will register their disapproval by voting in new directors. Erica Miller, Nightly Business Report, New York. Stocks on Wall Street moved broadly lower early today, partly in reaction to that disappointing outlook from AOL. And further weakness was triggered by Merrill Lynch's uh, strategist, Richard Bernstein, who called the market very speculative and cut his recommended stock allocation from 50 to 45 percent, while boosting bonds from 30 to 35 percent. 
A feeble afternoon rally attempt failed as, after two months of gains, many investors decided it was time to take some money off the table. As a result, the Dow Industrial Average closed with a loss of 119 points at 87.42.93. The Nasdaq Composite ended with about a 35-point loss at 1448.96. And the Standard & Poor's 500 down 13 and 3 quarter points, ending at 920.75. The 10-year note gained 7.30 seconds to 98 and 11.30 seconds, putting the yield at 4.2%. I'll be back a little later in the program with a look at our stocks in the news tonight. Paul, another dismal month for the nation's big three automakers, all posting double-digit sales drops in November. Sales at General Motors dropped 18% to 309,000 units, but GM is increasing fourth quarter production by 5,000 vehicles. Ford sales fell almost 17% to 261,000 cars and trucks, but Ford is cutting fourth quarter production by 25,000 units. And sales at Daimler Chrysler were down 12% to 158,000 last month. Analysts say the year-over-year -year drop was expected because that's when 0% financing first began. But the real problem for the big three is profit margins. Earnings are a lot worse than sales. I mean, for the full year, sales will probably be 16, 7, 16.8 million units. That's a little bit better than a trend year, and yet the industry's margin will only be 1%. Now, not that long ago, in this kind of a sales environment, the industry would make a 3 or 4% margin. So it's really profitless prosperity now, and it's take, you know, incentives are taking a big bite out of the profit picture. Cassessa does not own the stocks, but his firm, Merrill Lynch, does have investment banking relationships with GM Ford and Daimler Chrysler. Well, in other auto news today, General Motors said CEO Rick Wagoner will soon add chairman to his title. Wagoner will replace current chairman Jack Smith when Smith retires in May. Wagoner has been with GM for 25 years and has been CEO for two years, and at age 49 is the youngest company chairman since 1923, and that's when the legendary Alfred Sloan took the job. Just moments ago, the Walt Disney Company warned about earnings. Disney says its full year 2002 earnings will come in at 60 cents a share, a penny lower than expected due to the poor performance of its new animated feature, Treasure Planet. The company also says the Securities and Exchange Commission is probing the employment of family members of its independent directors. Disney also announced several measures aimed at boosting corporate governance, including the appointment of Senator George Mitchell as presiding director. And after hours trading, Disney shares were down almost a dollar. It closed off 85 cents at $18.54 in normal trading. Five Wall Street brokerage firms are in hot water tonight for not keeping their emails. The Securities and Exchange Commission has fined the group, including Solomon Smith Barney, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley, a total of $8.2 million. While not admitting or denying wrongdoing, the firms all say they'll review their procedures for dealing with electronic communications. The discovery that the firms weren't properly keeping emails came during an ongoing probe on analyst independence. And Paul, that same investigation is expected to end with brokerages hit with much larger fines over biased research. Well, Susie, things were just fine for investors to take some pretty good profits today. So now let's take a look at some stocks in the news tonight. And topping the big board's active list, AOL Time Warner's, you might expect, and a major loss of $2.36. That's a 14% drop. It traded 32.2 million shares. Then Nokia down 93 cents, even though the company said uh, there'll be a 10% cell phone sales growth in the year 2003, but that was at the lower end of estimates. Nortel Network's in there with a six-cent loss. Ford Motor down $1.49. It's November sales down 16.6%, and it plans to cut production in the fourth quarter. Merck, fifth in volume, down $1.13, traded as low as 55.25 today. There was nervousness ahead of the company's unscheduled conference phone call on Thursday, a week ahead of its analyst meeting. Also today, Merrill Lynch downgraded it from buy to sell. 
EMC down 75 cents. Motorola fell a dollar 19. General Electric 45 cent loss. Pfizer 12 cent drop. And then Texas Instruments tenth in volume was down 82 cents. Even though the company increased its earnings expectations from the street level of two cents a share all the way up to three cents a share. Looking at some individual issues, Barclays, uh, the big bank, down a dollar 26. The company warned its 2002 pre-tax profits will be at the low end of most forecasts, including its own. And then we see Navistar had a bad day, down three dollars 55. Company had fourth quarter operating loss of 98 cents versus earnings of 11 cents last year, but it had a total loss of seven dollars 58 cents a share due to increased costs of post-retirement benefits. Meanwhile, Standard & Poor's repeated a sell recommendation on Navistar. Healthcare properties down $3.99. The company sent lease termination and default notices to a major tenant, namely Centennial Healthcare, and that's for non-payment of rent under 20 different leases. Province Healthcare was uh, down $2.28. Company sees lower than expected fourth quarter revenues because volume from newly recruited physicians has not materialized as quickly as the company had planned. Albertsons, the big grocery chain, down $1.31. J.P. Morgan downgraded the stock from neutral to underweight. So the stock got hit. And then uh, DRS, this is a company involved in data storage. Uh, yesterday it announced plans to offer 4.75 million common shares. That means earnings dilution ahead. Solutia, the best percentage gainer on the big board, up nearly 40%. Uh, the uh, company is going to sell its specialty chemical unit for $500 million to a Belgian company called UCB. And then we see Hewlett Packard closing down 60 cents. After the close, the company said it expects to book $3 billion in savings next year with its purchase of compact computer but it would not raise earnings guidance because the information technology spending is still very tepid and after hours trading the stock fell to eighteen dollars and seventy four cents topping the active list Microsoft losing uh, 98 cents on Nasdaq then Intel off 74 cents Cisco down 54 cents C Cisco CEO would not give uh, analysts any earnings guidance for the second quarter instead he wants to focus on strategy for the moment KLA 10 core down two dollars forty six Dell computer bucked the overall trend with a 12 cent gain Qualcomm down a dollar eighty eight fifty three cent drop in Oracle Q logic losing a dollar forty three similar loss in Amgen and tenth in Nasdaq dollar volume was eBay off a dollar eighty six look at this gain one eight hundred contacts up nearly uh, well almost a hundred percent here the company has become the authorized contact lens retailer for none other than Johnson and Johnson Visticon unit and that's a very very positive development obviously Citrix Systems moved up a dollar twenty six after the company says it sees better than expected fourth quarter earnings in the range of 12 to 17 cents a share. Numerical Technologies down a dollar 56. Its president and chief executive officer Larry Hollitz has resigned and the Adams Harkness brokerage meanwhile downgraded the stock from buy to just market perform. Then Corixa up a dollar 42. Uh, the company and GlaxoSmithKline say the FDA has returned their cancer drug called Bexar to active review after getting more information about it as requested. And those are the stocks in the news tonight. Susie? Paul, among developing countries, Malaysia is in the forefront of emphasizing information technology. But many Malaysians in rural areas still haven't even seen a computer, let alone become comfortable using one. So as Ryan Malzer reports, two innovative projects are determined to change that. The mobile internet unit is a computer lab on wheels. Its destination, Malaysia's village schools. Where there are no phone lines, students can still simulate surfing the net thanks to the large store of web pages saved on the bus's database. But there's no electricity. A diesel-powered generator slides out of the bus's belly. The bus first rolled into this school about a year ago. But when they come in, it's boosts a sort of an interest in... led the employees <clears throat> to take some risks that perhaps were uh, out of bounds. Ayad Mitroff is an expert in crisis management. He says organizations like Enron find out very quickly who will fit into the corporate culture. The rest leave. That's why Mitroff says investors should ask tough questions to see whether a company has pushed out the critics and adopted what he calls a kill the messenger mentality. A culture of cover up. Does the culture really know how it denies crises, or does it want to have the truth be known and does it want to fix problems? Does it want to face up to reality? 
Wharton professor Michael Yusim was impressed when he saw then Enron CEO Ken Lay in action. Lay was supremely confident. But an overconfident CEO puts Yusim on alert the company may be playing down bad news. In that sense, Yusim says Enron proves the importance of top leadership. As the world turns here, it's going to stand for years now as a statement about the problems of arrogance and ultimately the failure of top leadership. Management gurus say Enron did do some good things. It pushed into new markets and shook up the once stodgy energy business. But they say Enron is sure to be remembered less for its culture of innovation and more as a story of overreaching worthy of a Greek tragedy. Darren Gersh, Nightly Business Report, Washington. A brutal day for WorldCom stock. It dropped another 5% on investor worries about the company's debt rating and rumors about CEO Bernard Ebers facing a margin call. The long-distance company told Nightly Business Report that Standard & Poor's has reassured it there are no debt downgrades in the works. WorldCom also told us that if Ebers were facing a margin call, he could meet it without selling WorldCom stock. The spokesman attributed the rumors to short sellers trying to drive down the stock price. But analysts say that the two-day sell-off makes WorldCom a prime takeover target. Well, I think it's very attractive. I think there's been uh, panic selling and uh, based on unfounded rumors. And I think it's, uh, you know, again, it's very attractive. I think it's a takeover candidate. And uh, at these prices, I think uh, some of the regional bell operating companies are probably salivating right now. And WorldCom repeated today that Evers has always said that the company is open to buyers. And if the right deal came along, he'd take it. Paul. WorldCom stock was among the NASDAQ most active. We'll see it in just a moment. A very impressive upside reversal here today, 144.62 uh, points, although didn't recoup of every, everything it lost the day before, but 19 stocks up for every 12 down, 88 new yearly highs, only 71 new lows. Tyco International on a massive 151 million shares topped the active list. It traded as low as 27 and a half this morning after the New York Times reported that uh, its chairman and chief financial officer sold $100 million worth of stock last year. But today, the same two gentlemen said that they're going to each buy a half a million shares. And uh, Standard & Poor's this afternoon said the company's answers to its questions on its accounting methods are satisfactory. That helped the stock, too. General Electric moving up 42 cents. AOL Time Warner down 30 cents. The company did report fourth quarter earnings. 33 cents up from 28 cents last year, right in line with street estimates. Sendent down 47 cents. And then uh, Elon tumbling $4.83 on concerns over its accounting practices. Traded as low as 22 and a half during the day. Quest Communications fell $1.01. Yesterday, the company reported a seven cent per share fourth quarter loss. And today, the Dresdner Kleinwood brokerage downgraded it from add to hold. Williams Companies, which has had some problems uh, uh, because it's an energy trader like Enron, down another 78 cents. American International Group down $1.55, even though the company says it sees no impact from its three partnerships with uh, PNC Financial, which is being investigated by the SEC and the Federal Reserve. AT&T Wireless down 25 cents, and Citigroup up 79 cents, tenth in big board volume. AT&T down 36 cents, fourth quarter loss of 39 cents versus a bigger loss of 45 cents a year ago, and without special charges, AT&T actually earned a nickel a share, about a penny above the street estimate. Bank of America up $2.46. First Boston brokerage upgraded it from hold to buy with a $70 share target. Conoco up 90 cents. Now the story here is Chevron Texaco said it's considering a buyout bid for either Conoco or Phillips Petroleum in an attempt to break up their proposed merger. That uh, stock of uh, Chevron actually dropped a little over $2 today. Guidant up $3.38. Fourth quarter earnings nicely higher, $0.47 cents up from 41 last year. Bank America upgraded it from market perform to buy. IBM up $2.55. Buckingham Research issued a strong buy on Big Blue. And Kraft Foods up $1.46. Fourth quarter earnings nicely higher, $0.32 cents up from last year's $0.24. Cents. Standard & Poor's and Morgan Stanley both repeated buy recommendations. Conseco was the best percentage gainer, a $0.64 cent rise. The company is selling its variable Annuity, annuity business and taking some other actions to generate 750 to 800 million dollars in order to assure liquidity for the company this year and next. FTI Consulting up two and a half dollars. Spokesman linked the strength 
to increasing demand for consulting firms like FTI because they specialize in bankruptcies and turnarounds. Another consulting company, Fair Isaac, had nicely higher earnings. First quarter, 57 cents up from last year's 40 cents. CIBC uh, uh, World Markets Brokerage upgraded at Hold to Buy. The big percentage loser, Cordian Communications, down $1.20. The company denied a rumor its CEO is under pressure to step down. Tommy Hilfiger down $2.48. Third quarter earnings lower, $0.41 cents versus last year's 47 And Alamosa Holdings down $0.80. Cents. Merrill Lynch downgraded it from buy to near-term neutral. NASDAQ trading a 20.5 point gain. Volume just over 2 billion shares. 19 stocks up for about every 16 down. Microsoft topped the active list up $0.53. Cents. And there you see WorldCom Group down $0.55. Cents. Uh, Cisco Systems, a uh, $0.33 cent rise. Intel gained a dollar eighteen. Siebel Systems, $0.73 cent rise, fifth in uh, dollar volume. Applied Materials up $1.85. Veritas Software down $3.04. Yesterday, the company reported a large loss. Oracle was up $0.12. Cents. Amgen gained $0.54. Cents, and Broadcom moving up $0.58, cents, tenth in volume. Crossman Communities up $4.25. Leave it to Beezer. Beezer Homes will acquire this company for $17.60 cash and the rest uh, stock and the total worth of that bid, $46 a share. Com CompuCredit down $3.63. The company had sharply lower fourth quarter earnings, $0.12 cents versus $24 the year before. Level 3 Communications down $0.95. Cents. Yesterday, the company reported a fourth quarter loss of $8.54 a share and it warned today it may violate uh, revenue requirements on a credit pact in the second quarter. The American Exchange index up a little over eight and a quarter points. Columbia Labs up $1.12. The company had a successful uh, trial of its bioadhesive drug delivery systems, and PR Energy was a big percentage loser on the curb. Finally, the index shares all in the plus column. That's the Wall Street wrap-up, Susie. Well, New York City is gearing up for the World Economic Forum. More than 3,000 of the world's top business and political leaders will gather at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel beginning tomorrow. It's the first time the forum will meet outside of Davos, Switzerland, where it has taken place every year since 1971. And security is tight. 4,000 police officers, many in riot gear, have been assigned to the event. Barriers surround the conference site, blocking off streets, causing, causing traffic gridlock in midtown Manhattan. Topping the agenda at this year's meeting, terrorism and the global recession. These meetings are very useful, not so much because they reach decisions, but because people come in with ideas, they share ideas, uh, they exchange points of view on how to deal with some of the major problems that the world economy faces and that the world faces in areas of political and security concerns. The five-day conference is expected to pump as much as $100 million into the New York City economy. And of course, we will have complete reports on news developments from the World Economic Forum. Tomorrow, we begin our World Economic Forum coverage, talking with Phil Condit, chairman of Boeing, the world's largest aircraft maker. There's a new Marlboro man at Philip Morris. He's Louis Camilleri, the world's largest tobacco company, announced today that Camilleri, Philip Morris's top accountant, will succeed Jeffrey Bible as chief executive officer in August. Camilleri takes over at a time when analysts say that the company faces greater regulation and more anti-tobacco litigation. Philip Morris also reported its fourth quarter earnings of 99 cents a share. That was right in line with estimates. The stock slipped 22 cents to $49.57. Uncle Sam wants you to file your income taxes electronically. So next week, President Bush will propose giving e-filers an extra 10 days to get their returns in. 45 million taxpayers are expected to file over the Internet this year, meaning 90 million will not, even though electronic filing is faster and more accurate. The 10-day deadline extension must be approved by Congress, and it wouldn't kick in until 2003. In the Money File tonight, think small. At least that's what Eric Schoenberg, Deputy Managing Editor of Business 2.0, thinks you should do. Small companies would seem to be the last place an investor would want to put money in uncertain times. They're the first to be cut off when the banks tighten credit. They're the first stock that nervous investors sell. And at this particular moment, 
They're coming off a 21% gain in the fourth quarter of last year. After that kind of run, you might wonder whether it's too late to join the fund. Well, that's exactly the right thing to wonder, but the answer experts say is, no, it's not too late. One reason is that the little guys are still extremely cheap compared to large company stocks. According to the researchers at the Leuthold Group in Minneapolis, the price earnings ratio for small caps is close to an all-time low against that of large company stocks. The average little guy's PE is 41% that of the average large cap. The previous low was 56% back in 1973. Now, those mismatches tend to balance themselves out over stretches of three to six years, so there's still time. Another reason to think small has to do with the economic cycle. Evidence is growing that the economy is starting to find its feet again. And over the past nine cycles, the first stocks to explode into a rebound have been the smaller ones. Now remember, none of these projections come with money-back guarantees. Maybe the economy won't rebound soon. You can dissipate some of the risk by investing through a solid small-cap mutual fund. At least you won't be blindsided by a blow-up at a single stock. But investing requires uncertainty. That's what you get paid for. And if it comes to a bet between small caps at modest PEs and big cap tech still selling at 95 times earnings, my money would be on the little guy. I'm Eric Turnberg. Recapping today's market action, no change in interest rates, so the Dow gains 144 points, the Nasdaq Composite climbs 20 points. And please be sure to join us at our worldwide website, nbr.com. And finally tonight, talk about an investment that's just too good to be true. McWardle Enterprises sells a handheld device that detects biohazards like anthrax. The company's website quotes praise from customers and analysts and claims a whopping 45% jump in quarterly earnings. But McWardle is a fake, and the Securities and Exchange Commission posted the website for the phony firm and two other hoaxes to deliver a lesson about the risks of online investing scams. Paul, the SEC even went so far as issuing a fake press release last week touting McWardle, and that resulted in more than 150,000 website visits in just three days. Caveat Amtor works electronically, too. You're absolutely <laughs> right. That's Nightly Business Report for Wednesday, January 30th. I'm Susie Garib. Good night, everyone. Good night to you, Paul. Good night, Susie. I'm Paul Kangas, wishing all of you the best of goodbyes. Nightly Business Report is brought to you by... Franklin Templeton Investments, providing a perspective for success through Franklin, Templeton, and Mutual Series Funds. Franklin Templeton Investments, gain perspective. Markets may rise or they may fall. Who helps companies prepare for the unpredictable? For business advisory services, the answer is the people of Deloitte & Touche. A.G. Edwards providing investment banking, cash management, and retirement plans for businesses. A.G. Edwards. Trusted advice. Exceptional service. And made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Explore one institution's enduring influence on the nation. Discover the story of West Point tonight at 8 here on Wisconsin Public Television. Now stay with us for the News Hour with Jim Lehrer. Nightly Business Report has a video for anyone who's thinking about investing in stocks. It's How Wall Street Works, winner of the American Film and Video Festival's Blue Ribbon Award. To order by credit card, call 1-800-535-5864.